Hello and welcome to the final week of the lecture series for the nonlinear modeling course. The final week, as I've mentioned here, is a sort of a mixed bag. Of course, there is a baseline instruction that, of course, I give you in the field of cohesive zone models. Uh, it's not extremely heavy uh, to deal with or to uh, teach because there is a lot that needs to be done by experience and by exercising over and over again. However, I'm also uh, used to teaching a bit more than the cohesive zone models in the last week of this course. Uh, these topics come from you as students. Uh, this week we have collected a few of these uh, topics already and during the online session we will be discussing these topics hands-on uh, by means of some examples and I will do the same in the classroom lectures as well. However, since they're not part of the fixed syllabus of this course, there will be no video recordings on those topics. So the topic that we will be working on this week is the cohesive zone modeling. Now the cohesive zone models are generally used for or they were developed particularly for the case of modeling fracture. Now fracture is a kind of failure that occurs in areas of the structure which are uh, within the structural dimensions. In the case of a certain fracture, when you have, uh, when you have this fracture within the area of the structural dimensions, then the fracture occurs by means of material separation at certain locations. Now these material separation laws are defined by means of traction separation laws in most cases. So of course within the framework of cohesive zone models there are certain things that come from a theoretical background just as in the case of other uh, kinds of nonlinear modeling and for this of course we have to look into something called the traction separation law. There are of course multiple kinds of traction separation laws but the basis of each of these traction separation laws is rather simple. You have an increase in the stress until a certain maximum condition, after which there is a loss in stiffness of the structure because of which you have a reduction in the stress and that should sort of uh, relax out up from ahead of a certain point. So the, uh, what you are actually plotting is the stress versus the strain or the displacement which happens at the point of this uh, fracture and the curve that lies under these curves, uh, the area that lies under these curves give you the fracture energy. And this is the basis of the traction separation laws. Of course, there are different uh, ways these traction separation laws work. Some of them may have high stiffness, low stiffness. You can have bilinear, trilinear, etc. However, the basic form is this one. The idea is that you have an increase in stress in your structure in this way. And when it reaches a certain maximum, the energy in the structure in the system due to the external work done overpowers the material's cohesive forces which is when this initial failure occurs so this is the point of initial failure and after the initial failure has happened there is a progression of failure so this is a progressive failure direction now, as I said, when the energy which is created in the structure due to the external work done overpowers the uh, material's cohesive forces, let me write this down for clarity. So let's say the energy due to the work, external work done, so let me write W external, is greater than the cohesive forces, then you will have to go into a traction separation law which is going to define a material failure or separation of the material when fracture occurs. 
Now, in order to make sure that we have this failure that is activated within your part, we can define certain special kind of elements which are known as interface elements which have to be present a priori in the model. So, special elements need to be created which behave according to the traction separation law and are the ones which mimic the situation of material separation at various interfaces. Now the downside of these special elements is that they have to be present a priori in the model. Therefore, apart from the regular mesh that you have on your part, you have to have extra elements present either in certain areas where you are certain that fracture will occur, while on the other cases, if you don't know where fracture is going to occur, then you have to have these special elements all around the system. So, cohesive zone models have, of course, certain pros and certain cons, like all methods. Cohesive zone models are good for cases when we know the crack path, right? When the crack path is known to us. Or we can even assume it. For example, the case of composite delamination. Now, delamination is a failure mode in composites where you have a number of layers in a composite laminate and the delamination will only happen at the interfaces of various plies. And this delamination is based on certain failure modes which are also developed by uh, scientists and you can use a number of these failure criteria to create a, fracture, uh, a traction separation law which can help in mimicking delamination at the plies or at the interply uh, location. So what is easy here is that we know that the crack is always going to appear at one of, the, uh, one of these locations at the interfaces. Now, on the other hand, when they will um, develop further or when they will progress, they will also stay within this ply uh, interface. So composite delamination, therefore, is a very good example where cohesive zone models are quite useful. However, cohesive zone models are not good when the crack parts are completely unknown. So the interface elements therefore have to be introduced everywhere at every element edge. So if I just take a small piece of a rectangular section of a continuum and I have all these elements forming the mesh, then I must have interface elements that are present at each and every element edge because we do not know where the crack is going to propagate or what is the direction or the path of the crack. So the biggest drawback that you can actually identify looking at this uh, situation when CZM is not useful is that it's highly mesh dependent. So if you're going to look at this structure, depending on how fine my mesh is, will determine or will give the possibility of having a crack path which is as detailed or as difficult as it can be. Also, another problem that is identified in these cases is that the crack path is also highly dependent on the initial crack length and the crack length that has to be used for progression. By producing a certain mesh which looks like this, we are assuming or we are limiting the condition that the crack must be initially present within either a length of this element, element length or a multiple of this element length as a crack initiation, yeah, initial crack length. But also at the same time, we can only have a crack which can be of a certain length 
which corresponds to the length of these element edges. So this is usually a very big question and you have to go through several mesh iterations before you can get the right value and then to finding convergence is a very difficult task. Now since you're also superposing two kinds of meshes on this, one with the regular elements, one with the special elements that represent the cohesive zone conditions, a lot of computational effort is required in order to find a solution. Therefore this use of this kind of a model is also highly computationally expensive. There are certain conditions where this uh, mesh can even take up to a month to give you a solution spe specifically for uh, dynamic problems such as impact in composite laminates where you also have impact itself is a dynamic situation with an impulse load where a lot of uh, regularization is required followed by mesh dependency both on the impact as well as on now on the damage conditions then you have to make sure you have the right mesh size so as to get the results that represent your experiments and finally you have three different kinds of non-linearities all coming together in the same problem therefore consideration is very highly recommended when and when not to use the cohesive zone model rather when is it actually useful to use the cohesive zone model to get results that are representative of what you're looking for.